It's so nice to be here. And thank you all for joining us today. I know it's sort of late for some of you, depending on where you are. Um, and I'm really excited about this. this is the third panel in a series that um, we've been curating uh, sort of on behalf of P5JS to share some of the work that our contributors and people working in adjacent communities have been doing um, and hopefully open up a conversation with all of you. Um, this last panel here, or this current panel, is um, all around consentful communication on the web. And we were talking in the um, planning for this panel that about how consentful is not actually a word, <laughs> but it was one that we felt um, represented what we, um, all of us were really interested in when it comes to communication. I think working on, um, so I've been leading the P5JS project since 2013, and um, working on that project, uh, it, I, it there was a lot of technical work that happened and a lot of uh, many different aspects of the project from design to software to documentation. Um, but I think when I, I just you know, passed on the role to um, someone else, and so I've been doing a lot of reflecting of, around that seven years of work. And one of the things that just kept coming up for me was thinking about how much the project really depended on communication and how essential that was and how much I learned about it through all the contributors over the years. And so um, I'm really happy to introduce this panel, which, um, which features three of them who have taught me so much. Um, so uh, before I introduce them, I realized I forgot to um, go over some basics here. So if you have questions um, as, a, as the presentations are going, you can put them in the chat and then we'll have some time for open conversation afterwards. You can also use your raise hand feature at that time and um, join the conversation directly. It doesn't need to be all mediated through chat. Um, and then also to describe myself for anyone that can't see, um, I'm a mixed race Chinese American woman with short dark hair and I'm wearing a collared shirt in the kind of black and white sweater right now and I'm sitting in my home. Um, and so this is also just a reminder to the panelists to please introduce or describe yourself and describe your slides if there's visual content on them as we're going along to make it more accessible. Um, cool, so I think we'll get right into it. As I mentioned, there's three presentations and then we'll go into a more open discussion. Um, and first up, we have Evelyn Meso, who is a person all the time, an engineering manager on weekdays and a poet on weekends. She's been working in and around open source software since 2017, primarily on P5JS and GitHub desktop. And she likes to talk about mixed identities, queer poetry, and her recent love for running. Originally from Ohio, she current lives, currently lives on unceded Tongva land near Los Angeles, and uses she and they pronouns. Uh, so go for it, Evelyn. Hi, uh, I'm Evelyn. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'll do a quick uh, short visual description of myself and my surroundings. Um, I'm light-skinned, non-binary, femish person uh, with like wavy brown hair, and I'm sitting in like a room with like white walls and a, a funky uh, orange deer stuffed animal head on the wall behind me, and I'm wearing like a collared shirt with, with stripes on it. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that I've been thinking about in regards to consent lately, uh, especially in open source software. As when I mentioned in the intro, a lot of my experience uh, that's relevant to this is, uh, yeah, through through working in open source on GitHub Desktop and then also like on P5JS. Um, and that work has taken a, a couple of different forms over the years. Uh, in some cases, it's been uh, writing workshops for like, how to get involved in contributing to open source, especially with P5.js. Um, sometimes it's been writing code and patches or like helping moderate a repo uh, on GitHub, uh, responding to issues, doing pull requests, writing code, um, documentation stuff, um, things all along those, all along that axis, I suppose. Um, but I think one thing I want to talk about today, especially in relation to this topic, is the role like in, in a lot of those activities, but especially communication on a platform like GitHub or any other sorts of any other sort of uh, online, primarily text based uh, collaboration platform, especially when it's involved in the production of like software of some sort. 
um, is the role of boundaries and consent. And so I'm going to start sharing uh, a couple slides now. Um, I wanted to start by sharing this uh, quotation from Prentice Hep Hemphill. Um, it says, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. Uh, Prentice is a, is a healer and uh, somatic uh, practitioner. I'm not sure where they're based. I forgot uh, after putting this together, but I think this is like a really nice way of, of crystallizing like the importance of boundaries and thus of like consent of saying like, yes, I agree to this thing um, or I don't, whether or not it's explicit or whether it's ex explicit or implicit. Um, and I, the thing that I think it's lost when we talk about uh, communication on platforms like GitHub or in open source in general uh, is that there's uh, two people on each side of, of most interactions, maybe more than two people, but uh, the, they can be roughly uh, grouped into like maintainers and contributors, right? Maintainers are the people that are uh, running the running the project or like putting in usually like more time and like kind of responsible for stewarding it and contributors are people that are um, bringing something to, to share. Um, and I put together a couple examples here of like a couple different issues and responses to them. I think so, if I, but I think it's like best summarized by saying that uh, as someone who's been a, a maintainer uh, on, of an open source project, um, there's definitely like an, uh, for myself, like there's been a play of like what my main, what my boundaries are as a maintainer for, and like negotiating it with like the boundaries of people that are contributing to the project or with other maintainers. Um, and so these two examples, uh, Sort of go that uh, I'm actually going to skip through for the in the sake of for the sake of time are sort of showing that like how if, if someone is like opens an issue or communication in a repo that I'm maintaining and uh, there's like kind of a bad faith uh, tone to that to that issue I, I probably won't spend as much time on it because I want to prioritize my energy for people that are acting in good faith and for people that are uh, marginalized or like not well not well, not well represented in in open source spaces. Um, so th there's like there's like kind of like a a gut process I feel like I sometimes go through when responding to things about like how much energy am I really willing to spend on something on this kind of like interaction with this person in this particular situation. Um, and so I'll skip ahead to just like this couple little graphics I made one being of like a, a Venn diagram of maintainers boundaries and contributors boundaries and how like finding the overlap there of like where there's like that space where you can both participate in a way that feels good for both of you um, is like a really important thing to like negotiate. And a lot of times I think on an open source, it can happen uh, very implicitly as well as explicitly. Um, and that there's like, a yeah, I think I'll just summarize and think there's like a lot of different ways to like communicate those different kinds of boundaries you have. Um, and framed in like another sense, it would be that like the, finding the, the meetup between like maintainers consent and contributors, contributors consent uh, is where you find open source collaboration. This is an image of a silly internet meme with two uh, very muscular people like like grasping hands. And so like the, each hand, each arm is labeled with maintainers consent and contributors consent and where their hands together is like open source collaboration. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there and invite whoever is next to uh, talk about their work. Awesome, thanks Evelyn. Um, so next up, we have Aron Montoya Moraga, who is a Chilean graduate student at MIT Media Lab's Opera of the Future and Future Sketches Research Groups. And Aron uses synthesizers, machine learning, and computers for audiovisual art projects. And is a contributor and open source enthusiast, regularly teaching with and contributing to the P5JS project. Go for it. Hi, thank you. Um... So my description would be I'm wearing glasses, I have short black hair, I'm wearing a kind of greenish t-shirt. Um, behind me there's a door and some computers. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share my slides right away. Um, they're here. Yeah, so today I wanted to share some thoughts about consent and um, I-18N, which stands for internationalization and also about media arts. So as I said, I'm currently a graduate student at MIT Media Lab in, in, in media arts. So I'm super lucky to be all day, my work is thinking about media arts and the tools and the practice. 
Uh, I consider my practice on machine learning nowadays and focusing with open source and algorithmic justice and biases. So with the Progressive Foundation, I have worked on the interna internationalization project. That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> Um, in particular, I led the translation of the P5JS book. There was an introduction to P5JS book that we released some years ago, and also the website, the whole reference. It's on Spanish, and we make our best to any new uh, content that we upload to uh, uh, translate it to Spanish, and also it's been expanded to more languages. I work on the Contributors Conference, which is intentionally named as Contributors Conference and not Developers Conference to make it more inclusive. And also I'm always on the repositories trying to moderate and the forum. So that's where my experience with consent comes from. And I wanna share some of my personal interfaces and challenges. Like I am not a native English speaker. I deal with having to think in English in a lot of the day, in Spanish. I've been out of my country for the most part for the last five years. So I feel like also my, even my Chilean Spanish is kind of outdated. There's all sorts of multiplicities of Spanish. There's a lot of problems there on uh, doubts about, am I saying the right things? Which I also have to do with consent in the sense of, I don't want to over, overstep people's boundaries. And I want to actually be, be true to what I want to say. So that's an important interface for me. And also I use a ton of tools and I am concerned about the ethics behind these tools, who are making them, why am I um, exploiting some other people with some tools I'm using with tracking. I'm also always thinking about the expectations from other people, uh, about their own biases, my own biases, how I, I am fair with myself and with others, and also about access and the data. Like I, we're living in a world we, where we have both access and we produce a lot of data and that those are very easy to co-opt by corporations, by people, by ourselves. So some doubts I usually deal with consent on dealing with uh, open public forums such as GitHub or working on the open and, and open source in my work. I always deal with like, am I doing enough or too much? As I, I'm being too extra to somebody on the internet, can they opt out of what I'm doing? Am I overwhelming with notifications? Uh, so it's really important for me to have an opt out. <laughs> um, am I using the right tone and words? Am I being uh, too condescending? Am I being too nice? Am I being encouraging? Um, and also like right now I'm talking in English and I use it on a daily basis. And there's are some aspects that we talk about in processing as in, if is it colonizing to read in English? Is it a, is it a, um, um, transparent way of communicating? Is it like, we try to reflect on the, the, um, side effects of everything we do. And in order to not be overwhelmed and not to be paralyzed with fear or anxiety and to actually do some work. There's some guiding documents that I wanted to share today that are really helpful for me or my practice. Um, I'm really proud and happy about the com community document, community statement of the P5JS um, a community. It's what actually led me to start working there in the first place and volunteering. We also uploaded some contributor docs for people that want to dive deeper and, and these are always being updated. Um, uh, aside from the P5JS and processing realm, I'm really excited about the Berlin Code of Conduct and also the Chatham House Rules that I, I encourage people to look them up. And in terms of my own practice, I would say that how I deal with consent on like a very rough, um, this is my minimum. I add licenses and disclaimers to everything I do. I say, this is what I did. This is the license. If you run this software that I wrote, these are the guarantees. Um, I also always try to add a context. I say it, it was me, this, um, it was this date. Cause I know that for example, it's so easy to cancel somebody for the past work, but everything, all the work comes from a context. So I try to give it like this, it was me on this date. Uh, that's very particular for me in 2020. Like I feel like most probably I'm gonna come out of the quarantine. I'm gonna say like, this idea was really dumb. It's like, oh, I was, isolated in my house in 2020. So like, it's very important to have a context. Um, also, I use open source in the sense that I, I consent, I read the disclaimer of the, I read the license of the tools I use. I, everything I do, I, I upload in tiny increments. Uh, I 
open my process to the world. I try to open the tools that I write so that nobody gets uh, conflicted with using what I do. That's very important for me. And in, in particular, that's why I wrote it in parentheses here at the end. That has led me to nowadays be working a lot with microcontrollers because they have no back doors. Even if I do self-surveillance on myself and I have microphones in my room and I rig sensors, I know that there's no back door for anyone to without my consent to work. And that is a very tiny computational experience that is slow, it's a microcontroller, but it has a different flavor that I'm exploring this, this current year that I'm really excited about. That's why I wanted to share it today. And I, as a final thought, I wanted to say that these are, this is my rules of thumb, that when I'm in doubtful if I'm, as, if I'm acting consentfully or if I'm doing the right thing, I try to do the research. I try to look up what I understand. I ask people if I cannot find the research, I try to listen to them, read them. I mostly try to slow down. I find myself when I'm in doubt, it's really easy to, it's really better to slow down and also practice self-care so I can have a clearer headspace that lets me, as Evelyn also pointed out, I try to assume good faith. And that's also the way I operate. I, if somebody, I ever act in a way that they don't like, at least I want to be given the benefit of the doubt that I was doing something in good faith. And those are my strategies for being conceptual and trying to work in the open and in organizations like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I love the, the um, kind of guidelines or these um, uh, grounding points that both you and Evelyn have laid out. And I'm gonna, um, I have some more specific questions too I wanna dig into, but I wanna go through each of you first and we'll dive in a little deeper. Um, so last, I'm excited to introduce Ching Ching, who is a, an interdisciplinary artist and community organizer working at the intersection of technology, labor, and identity. Ching co-founded Void Lab, an LA-based intersectional feminist collective dedicated to women, trans, and queer folks. They were the director and lead organizer for Processing Community Day in 2019, a worldwide initiative celebrating art, code, and diversity and they currently serve on the advisory board for the Processing Foundation. Their work has been exhibited and screened at Ars Electronica, DIS, Gene Cisco Film Center, Tiger Strikes, Asteroid, and Machine Project. And she received their MFA from UCLA Design Media Arts and teaches at Parsons School of Design as an assistant professor of interaction and media design. Hi, I'm Xing. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. I, I just feel so honored to be here and be with such a wonderful um, group of people on this panel. And um, I, I think I would start with a visual descriptor of myself. Um, I am a non-binary Han Taiwanese descendant with short asymmetrical haircut. Um, there's a few strands of white hair embedded in my black hair that is probably hard to see through the video chat. Um, I have a diamond shaped face, um, live olive skin, um, and I also have a um, wearing a black and white striped shirt. And I am using a virtual background. It is um, a white background with um, a pattern of black Sharpie strokes overlap on the white background. So, so I'm going to share my screen right now. And I'm also going to oops, share the link to my slideshow. Um, there are a couple embedded hyperlinks in here. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you have access to this. So today um, I am going to talk about a project I have been working on since July called TogetherNet. So this is, um, before talking about the project, before getting into it, I first wanna talk about um, what, what, what brought me to this project? What, what was the background of it? And, and basically I wanna start with the two questions that I had, um, basically around the time of when um, quarantine started. And the first question I had was, how would social media look like 
if it prioritizes user intentions behind every instance of online communication. In a way, this question has been sort of cooking and brewing in my mind for a very long time. And for some reason, um, the quarantine really allowed me to slow down. And, and very similar to what has been mentioned already, this like slowing down process actually had helped me to um, acknowledge, you know, the consent or the lack of consent that that I, in the relationship I've had with social media. And the second question I had um, in in May was like, what are what are ways to transform digital rights policies into an embodied practice? So so in a way, um, when I say embodied practice um, in a UI interface context, I'm thinking about a lot of the things that we might, you know, some of us might inherently know what, how to do or, or, you know, what to notice just by, you know, growing up or, or living through a certain era of um, digital practices. So for instance, being able to be able to recognize what's a spam mail and what isn't a spam mail and being able to recognize different kind of dark patterns that's um, embedded in like the user interface design. Um, I, I wonder what, what is the opposite way of um, thinking about this. Like if we were to transform digital rights uh, policies such as the right to be forgotten, the right to erasure into you know, a embodied form of user interface design, how would that look like? So um, I do not come in as an expert of consent by any mean. I am very much a baby <laughs> and I'm learning all the time. And I have definitely made mistake in the past in terms of crossing boundaries. And I might very likely um, mess up again because it is an ongoing practice. Um, that, that is where sort of I, I that, that is where I am right now in terms of how I understand this. So here are some readings that I have been looking into. I would very much encourage you if you're interested in diving into deeper into this topic to check out some of these readings. The first inspiration is Consent for Texting by Unali and Dan Tolliver, um, which was really the biggest inspiration for this project. And, and later on, I dive more into the specific topic of consent. Um, and, and how consent has been understood and practiced. And, and I think um, that actually led me to looking at the BDSM and kink community and, and seeing that there's just a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of information that is really highly applicable um, to all kinds of communities. So I'm going to just try to encapsulate as much as I can in this very short presentation. So, um, in order to consent to something, we have to fully and profoundly know that we don't have to do that thing now or ever, right? So, so I think that um, this sense, this sense of like being able to opt out <laughs> and but still be, just still have other options to participate is not necessarily something that. Um, we're very used to when it comes to thinking about building software or, or thinking like the way we approach like even like user agreements, right? So, so when, when um, in, 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 uh, as a continuation of this quotation, um, Meg John Barker also said that this applies whether the thing in question is having sex with a partner, doing the task we would set ourselves out on a particular day, hanging out with a friend, or being in a certain relationship or group. We have to know that nothing is contingent on it, that we're not bound by entitlement or obligation, <laughs> that there will be no punishment if we don't do it, and that there's no assumed default script or path that we're expected to follow here. So continuing this thought um, and referencing back to the consent for texting, it actually offer a very nice framework. Um, it's called a Fry's framework <laughs> that is also um, borrowed from the Planned Parenthood um, notion of what, con what practicing consent means. And if we were to think about the, the kinds of boundary and consentful practices that um, that has already been produced in other contexts in the physical world and, and start thinking about how that would map onto the digital world. I think a lot of very interesting dialogue and 
um, inspirations come out. So for instance, freely given is based on the notion of making sure that there is no coercion and manipulation. <laughs> and, and that essentially is what the dark pattern is all about, right? Like tricking someone to click on something or, or um, assuming that if someone agreed to one thing, then if someone, if someone signed up for like a free trial, it means that they're going to pay at the end of the free trial, right? That is a very specific kind of strategy that is also crossing consent. So the, also I think another really interesting one is like thinking about reversibil reversibility. If someone agreed to something, they should be able to change their mind at any time. It shouldn't be this kind of like contract that they signed themselves off to. So, so in a way, um, I, I sort of brought a lot of these keywords and, and thoughts back into the project TogetherNet, um, which is a communication software that has both a P2P chat feature as well as a archival chat mode. So um, what you're seeing on this, uh, what you would see on the screen right now is three different kinds of network. Um, and one is decentralized, which is uh, in the arrangement of a star shape. And the middle one is distributed, which is in the shape of a net. <laughs> and the one on the right is decentralized, which looks like a couple of different star shape uh, with some loose connection between each other. And so, so in thinking about how each of these network might respond or not respond to uh, consentful practices, I eventually ended up with um, thinking about, okay, so, so I do need a portion of this chat to operate on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and what protocol would I use? And what you see on the screen right now is like three different icons. There's the WebRTC icon and there's the HyperCore icon in the center. And there's also uh, the secure, secure uh, net uh, scuttlebutt on the right. And so I, I essentially use Found, found my own matrix. And in terms of like evaluating protocols using um, the five keywords that I have mentioned and think about which one would work best <laughs> based on um, a consentful practice and building consentful tech. Eventually I ended up with WebRTC um, on the screen. There, there are two different um, nodes, two different computers, routers and with connected to two different users browsers. And the idea of WebRTC is that you make uh, two different browsers, two different users make initial connection um, with each other through WebSocket. They exchange peer ID on something called the signaling server. And after that, they are able to essentially like learn each other's addresses and be able to find each other directly and connect and communicate through a data channel without going through a server. So, so that is um, part of what this software is. So, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is um, it's, a, it's the interface and we are in the peer-to-peer -peer ephemeral mode. And in this mode, which I am calling <laughs> sitting at the park right now, uh, the tab uh, says sitting at a park, it's currently activated and you see a, a couple of different avatars, um, essentially representing different users in this space. And they're able to um, communicate with each other in a way that's very much spatial. Um, it, it's almost like a hybrid between a game space where you can walk around and a text chat. So there are many different things I can get into, but I think I'll just be brief. So there's um, basically in this space, every single chat communication is um, ephemeral. It Once the browser closes, everything is erased. Um, obviously, if, if someone wants to or you know, decide to take a photo of the, the computer or copy and paste certain things. There's uh, there's no way to go around that. But but as much as possible, I'm trying to keep it within the browser and keep it ephemeral. And so um, if like the whole idea of the software is that in order to archive content, in order for data to live on a server, the group uh, that is meeting with each other needs to achieve consent. And this is a feature called consent to archive. When a message is being left on the screen, one would need to hover their cursor over the message and 
hold on to it. And, and a menu called Ask for Consent to Archive is going to come out. And once that happens, um, all the other avatars will have to overlap that message and hit enter in order to achieve consent. And consent can also, consent and messages can also be revoked at any time. So something that gets pushed to the archive can also be deleted and taken back. So this is one of the features that I thought I would share. Um, on this screen, you're seeing this is the archival mode where once messages get passed and stored into the archival mode, um, you would see it sort of, you know, the goal here is to like visualize and align these messages in a way that would mirror the, the database infrastructure as much as possible. So on the left, um, you see a kind of like a history uh, window where different messages are lined up in multiple rows. <clears throat> And some messages, or one of the messages, um, there's a there's a sign that is being revoked. Um, so even though there's no content, there's in a way an empty message, but you would still see that, oh, this person has revoked the message. And, um, sorry, how much time do I have? Oh, we're fine. Um, okay. <laughs> I think the other two are very quick, so you can take whatever time you need. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so, <clears throat> so then this this essentially like this this line of research and thinking um, together net really sort of like put me into a wormhole. Like the deeper I think about it, the deeper I go into it, the more expensive it gets in a way. So eventually, I had to like really map out and categorize <laughs> like what are the different kinds of content I'm really thinking about here. And ultimately, I ended up with three different layers. The first layer is the content between peer and peer. And the second layer is peer to server. And the third layer is server to server. And very interestingly, I, um, at least from my current perspective, I think peer to server which is the, the consent that I feel like I, I'm most, you know, violated by on a day-to-day -day basis in my interaction with Instagram or, <laughs> you know, Facebook or whatnot. That, that layer of consent in order, to, in, in a way, is the most plausible to achieve <laughs> or like, you know, it's like the most plausible to like think about, okay, so, so you have to build a future feature to, to, to allow user to like take their data back or, or to find other ways to use the software without agreeing to certain things. In a way that's, that's just thinking about how, how you're gonna arrange different features together, where I think that, you know, how, how the software encourage a consentful peer-to-peer -peer communication is a very big and complicated question <laughs> that I don't have any answers for. Um, but I'm very excited to continue to explore. And the third layer, which is the idea of server to server consent, is something I'm very excited about. Um, and maybe a little more directly related to W3C, <laughs> um, because I am planning on using the activity pub. Um, which is a social networking protocol that gives application um, a common language to be able to communicate with each other. So the idea for um, this is that there would be a code of consent specification that will be hosted on the activity pub. And so that, you know, very similar to how different kinds, different email servers can connect and communicate with each other in a way, different instances of TogetherNet can communicate with each other um, by evaluating whether they have matching or different code of consent. Um, so this is, this is basically the world I'm imagining together net would be joining, which is that, um, the Fediverse, which is, this is like a list of different, um, you know, social media, social network on, on the Fediverse that all uses the activity pub protocol. And so if you see two instances, let's say, you know, you have an instance for your group, I have an instance for my group. If we have matching code of consent, then it would be possible to, to think about data portability and think about ways for co um, communication to, to cross um, versus if you have mismatch code of consent, um, a layer of protection would be in place where maybe additional information will be needed from both sides in order for the two to communicate. 
in a way, this is very much responding to, you know, um, some of the issues that social media on the federated network might be experiencing in terms of feeling like since, since everybody is hosting their own instances on their own server, it becomes very difficult to think about centralized moderation, uh, you know, the kinds that, you know, maybe Twitter can enforce. Um, so so this, this for me is, is a way to kind of like come in between a centralized moderation model versus like, you know, an instance-based moderation model. And I think um, last but not least, <laughs> I would like to give my special thanks to Dorothy Santos, who I believe is on this call right now, um, just giving me the inspiration and idea on the on, on how, I basically remember when I, when I had the first phone call with Dorothy, Dorothy was like, you shouldn't call this a chat room. Chat room is not consentful. <laughs> and I was like, you're totally right. <laughs> and so, yeah, the idea that play is not fun without consent, right? Like the idea that, oh, we should be able to just casually chat or just just have fun. <laughs> like it's, that is not, you know, that, that imagination of play is not always going to be fun for everybody if consent is not, communicated beforehand. And the second idea, I want to give my special thanks to Maxwell Mutanda and Laura McCarthy. And it's really, these two people really helped me um, or sort of like highlight the notion of speed and highlight the notion of how, how like being slow is very much part of consentful communication. And that, and that more than anything, it's important to think about moving at the speed of trust and what it takes to um, for that to happen, even on you know on the level of like interface design. And um, here, this is I think a, a quote that I I was drawn to from Consent Culture. It's an article on the blog. Of, Provocracy. So I think part of the reason we have trouble drawing the line, it's not okay to force someone into sexual activity, is that in many ways, forcing people to do things is part of our culture in general. So cut that S out of your life. If someone doesn't want to go to a party, try a new food, get up and dance, make small talk at the lunch table, that's your right. Stop the all come on or just this once and the games where you playfully force someone to play along. Accept, accept that no means no all the time. And obviously uh, as an extension, yes means yes, right? So, <clears throat> so this is, um, I guess where I would leave this at in the sense of like, I think th making this project is also very much simultaneously a reflection on how we can go beyond the normative default scripts of how users ought to interact or how user and server ought to interact. And I very much um, look forward to this, the discussion and to, to think about you know, what, what else is out there? How, how can we imagine outside of this framework? Um, if you're interested in learning more about this project, there is a website and you can also email me. Um, I am going to begin hosting some co-designing workshops and I would very, very much love anyone's participation. Also, I have to mention that um, this project was produced at iBeam. So thank you, my iBeam team and organizer supporters. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, these are all really, really wonderful. And you can see people silently <laughs> clapping. Um, so uh, let's see. There, there, I know the panelists have a number of questions for each other. If you have questions as a participant here, you can put them in the chat or raise, click the raise hand and I can call on you or move to you. Um, but first I had a couple of questions of my own. And um, what I really love about kind of what all three of you are getting at and then Shin, you just gave us a really nice case study is this idea of like basically encoding some of these values directly into the system. Um, so starting with what are the values and thinking about how does that play out um, in the technical decisions you're making or in the documentation that you're writing around it. Um, and so I just wanted to invite um, Evelyn and Aron to expand on their work a little bit. Um, Evelyn, I was thinking particularly of like, I feel like that's a lot of the work that you've been doing over the last couple of years, at least with P5 and probably with GitHub too, has been um, thinking of like trying to feel out or um, help guide some of the values of the community and then find ways to 
document them or encode them. Um, I'm thinking specifically of like the accessibility or the access statement that you drafted um, or your work on the friendly error system. And I'm wondering if you want to um, talk about either of those and maybe some of your thinking around it. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I was thinking about, it would be good to mention the access statement. So I, th I think maybe the, the thing that comes up for me around those things about like encoding things into technology is like, actually this is like something that uh, Shani McLean Holloway mentioned in an earlier panel that I saw about how like technology, or maybe it was a different talk of hers, I might be wrong, but about how like technology is like in a broad sense, like lots of things that aren't just like computers, like um, certain kinds of like practices and, and um, yeah, practice, I guess this is like another way of saying technology. And so I think like bureaucracy and like documenting like policies and things like that is like also a form of like technology and uh, sort of encoding or like reinforcing certain kinds of like values or practices. And so like, I think the access statement uh, for P5 is a, sort of a, a document slash statement that says that as a community, we're deferring on like building new features that aren't related to increasing access uh, to P5GS and like creative coding or coding in general, um, while also like maintaining like things that things that currently exist. So it's kind of like a like we'll, we are agreeing to like keep fixing and like maintaining the things that already exist, but we're not going to add like new features that aren't like directly tied. And so I, I think it's I think everyone actually added that some some reference to that in some of our like opening issue templates and like PR templates, like just basically just, like a question is like how does this feature request or like enhancement relate to accessibility. Uh, and I think it's been really nice to have those conversations like really forefronted as we discuss uh, taking on new things um, or building new things or accepting contributions of certain kinds. Um, so yeah, I think that's like, that's, yeah, I think there's like a couple of ways that technology can like reinforce those uh, kind of like agreements, but I think like uh, constructing them and cons building consensus around them and then recording them in some way is also like a, a way of pushing that forward too. Thanks. Yeah, and I remember um, when we first sort of raised that idea of like, we won't add any new features except those that increase access. There was a, I think there was some moment of worry that this would like, because one of our goals, right, is to and be as inclusive and inviting as possible in terms of new people coming to the project. So is this like raising the barrier or making it harder mm. for people to contribute or to suggest their idea? And I think where we landed was that the point is not about shutting people down and saying, no, we're closing your pull request, but opening up a conversation about what is access and is there a way to adjust this um, you know, feature request so that it is you know, taking into account access in its many dimensions. Yeah. Um, I think one other thing I'll mention about that is part of the part of my motivation for doing that is because as like someone who was helping maintain, like I was spending a lot of energy on issues that I felt like weren't as like important to like what I felt like the values of the community were. And so I wanted to have like a way for us to be like, hey, these things are not as important as like spending time on these other things. Um, yeah. Totally. Um, and that makes me think also of, um, uh, I mean, that may, makes me think of just like how helpful documentation and like setting out the priorities can be, especially for new people coming into a project because you don't feel like you're kind of stumbling around in the dark trying to figure out where you won't get shut down or turned away. Um, and it makes me think, Aron, of your work um, on, with the internationalization and um, I'm, I'm remembering specifically your work on the Global Contributors Toolkit that you were working on this summer with some collaborators, I think. Nevto is one of them and is maybe here in the chat too. Um, and I, I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. I thought what was really interesting about it was that you were creating a document that was um, aimed at helping like onboard people to just be able to contribute to internationalization efforts. But then you, your group really went much further in thinking about what does that actually mean in terms of the project or in terms of um, the larger dynamics of society. Um, sure. So yeah, last last year on the contributors conference, um, we started talking a lot about we we started from the um, idea that everybody that was there was very different, and we tried to come together with language and also from a place of trust 
of um, being able to talk things that might be uncomfortable. Like we talk about colonization. We try to go super deep to the topics and how we felt about any aspect about P5, about promoting a tool that was invented in the US, built on computers that run in operating systems. Cause like we talk, I remember like I found language to explain um, really really difficult things that I think on a daily basis, but or like gut feelings like I feel like sometimes the correct answer is to give up, to say like I'm gonna burn my computer and move to the mountains and never touch it again. But at the end I also want to be part of the world. And how do I not feel guilty about engaging with that world? How do I not promote things that might be hurtful for other people? How do I keep on listening? So like, I think like that was the basis of the conversation that led to this document that Lauren posted on the, on the chat. And the most important thing is that it's an ongoing conversation and also acknowledging that it's a very difficult conversation and uh, it's a necessary conversation. Thank you. Um, and then I know that all three of you had some questions for each other and they're all, you shared them with me ahead of time. They're all really great. So would any one of you want to jump in here with, um, with a question for the group? I'm kind of dying to ask one right now. Um, <laughs> especially like with what everyone just mentioned around, uh, yeah, like the fact that like, we, we can choose not to like use computers or like, et cetera, et cetera. But there's like a, a cost to that or like a loss of access of certain kinds of communities and things and information and things like that. Um, so I was actually curious to hear like both Shin and Aaron talk a little bit about like, how do you think about like power differentials and differences in access if you like opt out of like a particular kind of like platform or community or like forum? Um, like for like for Shing, like uh, in the application you're talking about, like I can opt out of like using the application, but like I also, but it like depends like where where communities are too, right? Um, yeah, I I think it's a very I, I I was thinking about the same question, and I I think it's very um, difficult when you know, like my, the team I have right now is me and one other person. <laughs> so, so it's, it's a question of balance as well. Like, I think, I think one of, you know, the goals I have is to, you know, first of all, this open source project and the goal is to think of how we can pluralize <laughs> um, the, the way this software works and iterate for different communities as much as possible, but also recognizing that, um, you know, a lot of times when we sort of leave it at that, the communities who are able to iterate and, and create their own versions are already very tech savvy and have a deep root in tech, you know? So, so it's, it's already cutting out a lot of access and, and situating the project in a very particular culture. So um, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't know if I have an answer, but, but I think that, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is to, try to make you know really good highly accessible tutorials <laughs> on on how to how to how to make some of those pluralizations remixing happen you know i think p5 and processing foundation set very good precedents on what accessible tutorials look like <laughs> and and i think um on the other hand you know like possibly like as this project goes on um instead of like building the the base template and and like expanding that focus on you know using the funding or support that i might possibly get to to work with other communities right and be their tech support and and co-design with them and i, I guess like yeah, Aaron, I'd like, like to, love to hear from you too, especially around like, yeah, what is like, how does consent work when you, there's like such a, a huge amount of access like tied to a decision like that? Yeah, my first thought to start answering that is that I have the, I think on popular opinion that computers are too amazing nowadays. Like I'm, I decided at some point, like I went to electrical engineering for undergrad 
And there's a lot of talk about productivity and the more law of let's make things faster for faster sake. And I think that I am a big proponent of like, let's not, uh, let's stop investing on faster computers. Let's understand what we have right now. And that's something that I think highly resonated with Progressive Foundation because uh, the Progressive Foundation is a way of paving the way for things that you can do already with computers to make them in a collaborative way to like, it's like paving the road of these very difficult mountains to climb. And I think a lot of my work is like that. I'm never looking for making, for optimizing or for um, reaching the unknown. I'm mostly about understanding and making these things more available for society so that it, we can all discuss if we think they're right or not. And that's like consent on a citizen level. I feel like there's something about my experience in Latin America is like very crass can be, it's like you're super cool if you have the device. And here I see people from a hacker culture where um, you're cool when you can actually program on it. So there's like a different realm. There's something about the, I've always thought that the transistor made a huge change because before the transistor, like you had these big radios or you had these big cars where you could see the parts and what was broken and you can actually manipulate them and modify them. But then at some point they become these tiny chips that you cannot open them. So you start to like, and they're so magical and powerful that I think that you just try not to worry about it. So, and somebody starts making decisions about you and you give away your, your rights, you give away a lot of your agency. So a lot of my work is about uh, making things are not flashy, not fast, but they're actually, you know what's going on inside. That's how I'm reclaiming that space. That's how I feel comfortable. And I feel like I'm never gonna have enough time to do that. Thank you. Um, and just to recap a little bit of what's happening in the chat, um, there are a few people responding to um, uh, uh, well, all of your ideas. <laughs> but one thread I see is thinking about like, what does that actually, how do these ideas of um, revocability or consent actually play out in the, in the, you know, if we're thinking about specifications for the web, what, what might you add or what APIs or user interface changes do we want to see? Um, but I think I would open that up a little more and just because I liked, um, uh, so Bert and Jeffrey, I hope I'm recapping your questions properly here, but it's, it's, you know, thinking about models for working with data, like the GDPR in Europe. Um, but like, how do we, what do you want to see? And then to open it up, I liked this um, question from Jeffrey, which is, what are the questions you ask before adding something? Um, or maybe what are the values that you're trying to keep in mind as you're making those decisions? So maybe we don't, if you're less familiar with the uh, particular spec or API, I would put it to you like that. Like what, um, yeah, what are the questions that you think are important to ask when you're thinking about adding a new feature or going in a new direction or building a new tool? Um, I think one, one example that I often think about is um, how, how in Signal, there's a way to um, turn on the feature where um, that prevents a screenshot. And, and I, think, I think there was, I believe there was a time where it was like automatically on, now it's automatically off. <laughs> and I think, I think it's a very, you know, not Signal specific, but just in general, thinking about the, the boundary between um, security and consent is really interesting to me <laughs> um, because because when 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 you um, turn screenshot of prevention on automatically although it is more secure there is also almost a illusion that you know like it, you know like someone can just take a photo of the phone <laughs> you know or someone can just take a screenshot you know, in some other ways, right? And and so so it's I, I think I think sometimes like automating that um, need for security is not always the most consentful way to go about it. It doesn't really directly answer the question, but I guess I just I'm just thinking a lot about you know what what is the kind of expectation I'm presenting <laughs> through adding a new feature. 
and and how sometimes you know like adding adding a new feature even though it might seem like it's it's a very good idea might actually take some of that agency away <laughs> or or that 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 transparency of what could actually happen away so yeah it's it's a bit of a just an example and half answer but it's something that i think about a lot yeah i would say that also like any request for new features also uh assumes that somebody is going to read it and like as part of like, like what she was explaining like you need to also understand that maybe it won't be read maybe like a, a lot of ways that i'm still able to participate on the project foundation over the years is because they're very people first so i've been called to like work less to not burn out and at the end no matter how oppressive a computer could be or consentless they're made by people so as the same as the laws of physics allow for weapons to be fabricated we need to work on education and self-respect and love for each other so that even though awful things can be done, nobody's going to have the heart to do them because we care about each other. So um, yeah, that's my hippie message. There was, one, it was something I saw in the chat that I think was related to this um, around like, how do you communicate like what someone needs to know to like consent to something, uh, especially around like APIs and like, uh, in software and mostly I just wanted to say that's really hard like I, I used to work as a UX designer for Linksys like working on like the UX flows for like setting up your home uh, Wi-Fi network and like trying to like explain to someone who like doesn't want to spend that much time on this like what are the implications of like using a particular kind of like security or uh, putting the router into bridge mode or like whatever it's just like there's so much you can explain but also like I think a lot of it has to do with the context and like the situation the user, the person who you're, who you're like communicating with is in. And it's really, it's like, so it's a lot of effort to like encode all the different, how to like know what that situation is in the context and also like, you know, create the uh, complete diagram and logic of like, given these conditions, we think this person is in this situation and therefore we want to tell them these things. Um, I think I'm just saying it's really hard. It's a lot, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's obviously important. It's just, so much easier when it's like in your head and you're like in person with someone else or on Zoom with someone else and you have some like context on this person or what the situation is. Thank you. I'm gonna bring us to a close unless any of the panelists wanted to share any last thoughts that they didn't get to yet. Okay. Um, so this, yeah, I mean, everything that you you all are saying has inspired a lot of like reflection and conversation in the chat as well. Um, I think it's just such a huge topic, you know, everything from thinking about how do you onboard new contributors to how do you document the values or um, principles of a project to how do you build that into the technology and then how do you communicate it through notifications or UI decisions or APIs. Um, and uh, I, I think one of the um, one of the things I'm excited about here is like I, it just points to the need to actually like I think a lot of times like communication gets like thrown to the wayside, like, oh yeah, it's gonna happen. And to actually take the time to have explicit conversations about it, I think is one starting point to unpack these. So I'm really glad that we could do that today. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just add an edit to something I said earlier, because I shouted out to Naoto Heido, who was um, helping along with the Global Contributors um, Toolkit, but I see that also Shin Chin Ye is here. And I wanted to um, say thank you there her as well. Um, but I think that's all our session. I'm sorry I couldn't ask all of these questions here, but I hope that the conversations can keep going. Um, and yeah, thank you again to the panelists and to um, TPAC and W3C for letting us join with this panel today and for all of you for being here and um, especially to Dom for helping organize all of this. Um, thanks. <laughs>